In Focus is powered in part by Go Chevrolet at I-25 and the Boulder Turnpike. Your source for new or used cars and trucks and reliable service for most makes and models. GoAutoChevrolet.com Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. Tonight we close out the year with a brief look back at highlights from special episodes in 2012. Local theater continued to be a major part of our coverage this year. And while these companies made attention getting headlines, we continued to expand our coverage to include all forms of theater, dance, music, and visual arts. We begin our look back at the Denver Center Theater Company during the Colorado New Play Summit and the world premiere of The Whale. I, I mean, I frequently write about religion. I, uh, I mean, I, I went to, a, for a while, I went to a fundamentalist Christian high school in Idaho when I was growing up, and uh, so it, it's something that I feel, I mean, religion and Christianity especially is something I feel very close to and, and something I frequently return to in my writing. I've never written about Mormonism, which is strange because I grew up in Idaho, and Idaho is, you know, has a very big Mormon population. There was just something about this play where it, it felt like the play feels so uh, American in a way, so sort of deeply American. I mean, it's set in this sort of like, you know, drywall, sort of cheaply constructed two-story building that are, you know, re reproduced ad infinitum across the country now. And, uh, and you know, it's so, it's so specifically set in Idaho. There's something about Mormonism being this sort of new religion, this American religion, you know, felt really appropriate. And I mean, he has a line in the play where he says, um, you know, you're, you're so close in time and space to God's revelation. Uh, you know, that, that there's some, so there's something sort of nicely contrasting and maybe there's some sort of like cognitive dissonance about, you know, this man who's sort of uh, kind of self-destructing in, in his apartment and then this, this sort of young boy, this lively, you know, alive young boy, you know, uh, comes and offers him, you know, God, you know, sort of on a platter mm -hmm. in a way, so. So when you found this story, was it Charlie you found first? Was it the relationship of a... Uh, an estranged father and a daughter that you found first. Where did you begin? It was definitely Charlie, um, and then things kind of unfolded out of that. Charlie, I, I mean, I've, I think I've always been interested in characters who, you know, when we meet them initially, we might, uh, you know, have judgments about them or, or think badly of them or, or, or sort of want to look away. And then the rest of the play is kind of the process of unpacking that person and making them human. You know, uh, I mean, most of my plays I think do that sort of present us with people that maybe initially we, we don't, we label in a certain way, but then, but then the play brings in you know, humanity to them. This year we went behind the scenes with Colorado Ballet as they bring us a new production of Peter Pan from Milwaukee Ballet. It's the same creative team that brought Dracula to Colorado Ballet. We joined them for the first day of flying rehearsals at the studio loft at the Ellie Calkins. Mm -hmm. The company gets instruction from the team at ZFX Flying Effects, who designed the rigging used in this production of Peter Pan. During one of the early breaks and rehearsals, we had a chance to meet with Milwaukee Ballet's artistic director and choreographer of this original production of Peter Pan, Michael Pink. What is, what is different about mounting this ballet on a new company? Since it's only been done on your own company, and this is your first time bringing it elsewhere, what is that like? What's different about it? It's always very exciting when uh, you've created a piece and then you get to recreate it or restage it with another company. And I have to tell you that um, of the two years that we were in production for this production, making the scenery, writing the music, preparing everything, I had a modest five weeks to actually physically create it with the artist, oh. with all the flying, with everything. So invariably there were a lot of things that um, I just wished I'd had more time to do. So the opportunity of bringing it back here is I've got a long to-do list and I've been able to tick off quite a few of those to-do things and see if I can make them uh, improve them. So I love the fact that it's always evolving and it means that these artists feel like this is their version of this production. And that sort of sets up a relationship 
with Dracula and now Peter Pan of almost being sister companies in a way. You're absolutely right. I mean, I love the idea of saying that uh, my company uh, feels exactly the same as this company. And I love that you talked about part of your inspiration was the take of everyone wanting a mother. Mm -hmm. um, is this a, a, a production that was inspired in any way or are there any hints of your relationship with your mother in this relationship? Well, you know, strangely or not, no, that's the first time I've been asked that question. And, and no, I think it's probably more to do with having young children mm. and the whole thing of not wanting to grow up. I mean, I'm of an age where I just don't want to, I want to stop now. I want to go start going backwards. <laughs> I love the fact that through my art form, I'm able, able to recapture my youth. And there are so many opportunities in this ballet when we look at the moments when people, the characters, recapture their youth. The perfect one is the father. Here is a father mm -hmm. with young children wanting to be a success, be serious, be grown up, and through his endeavors to do that, he inadvertently takes Nana out of the nursery and thereby allowing Peter to come in and take the children to Neverland. He feels totally responsible for that. So the moment when they return, he realizes that he can be a success, but he doesn't have to do that at the expense of his, of his imagination and his youth. And he recaptures his youth and once again becomes like his children and you see him happy and fulfilled and that's wonderful. So I think there's very strong messages about let's never ever lose connection to our youth and to our, our youthful imagination. I love that. I, I love that. Not only is it for the, the characters' relationships to wanting a mother, but that description of fatherhood and recapturing your youth through your children. I think that many audience members will be able to identify that. I can't wait to share it with them. Thank you for taking time as you're rehearsing your, your first day of flying to tell us about Peter Pan. It's my pleasure, Eden. Thank you. This year gave us special visits to Opera Colorado during rehearsals for a brand new production of Florencia and El Amazonas. It's such a clever concept to put us on the boat. Um, mm -hmm. It seems so natural. How did that happen? Because I know you started working with the director very early, mm -hmm. which is, as we learned last time, unusual in opera. Right. You know, when you're creating a new production, what you really have to do is think very, um, you have to be very savvy about how do you put together your design team, your creative team, that's going to bring this piece to life. And we instantly knew, uh, because of the Spanish language aspect of this piece, the South American or Latin American aspect, we wanted a director who could immediately connect with that. And of course, Jose Maria Condemi was right at the top of that list. Out and we built here in Colorado? Well, we bid it out to several um, sort of uh, design, build uh, firms across the U.S. that do theater design work. Um, and I was just thrilled that, you know, right here in Denver, um, our, our own stagehands uh, worked out of our warehouse and had the best bid. And strangely enough, when Philip Lino, the designer, came down from Seattle, very famous opera company with a very reputable, highly reputable um, scene shop, um, came down and looked at the first build the, and he said this is some of the best work I've ever seen I don't need to come back and supervise anything else I trust your gentleman to take care of it and it's been fabulous and then the projection design also has a Colorado connection which is just so wonderful yeah, it, it really is you know we've been looking for various people to do projection work for us and it just came to our attention that Aaron Rhine um, was you know grew up here in Denver and he's now doing wonderful work on Broadway and elsewhere uh, in the video and and projection uh, uh, design industry and you know we invited him to come on in this project and he was just thrilled uh, to be able to get to work here in Denver in his hometown we were able to put Opera Colorado's history in context and looking to the future with special guest Ellie Calkins and fellow board member Larry Zimmer. We met during rehearsals at the end of last season. Beside the ability to afford the production values from Opera Colorado from then till now, what, what do you see as the biggest oh difference? Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> I say with 
a great sense of pride and some embarrassment that we are in the Ellie Calkins Opera House. Well, what, was, what, was, what was your home? What was that? What was that? Where? where, where? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big name dropper. Yes. Um, Nat was very creative doing operas in the round in Betcher Hall. And we did some absolutely spectacular ones, including the two of 1985. But we're in much better shape now. This facility is impressive no matter where you've come from, no matter what your background is in theater. When you walk into this building, this is something to see. People and tell us and the, uh, the acoustics are really yummy and rich and round. What does it feel like when you walk in and you're walking underneath your name to get in the door? <laughs> well, I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Ever since September 10th, 2005, it's mm -hmm. been my home away from home. Yeah. And for you, having been involved in the opera for so long, 28 years, you said. Mm -hmm. What is Actually, it? Actually, I'm as longer than that because I. Was, I mean, I've been on the board for 20 years, years, but I was with Nat when he came out and collected $10 a person to be in the grassroots movement for opera. So when you so, walk in and see where oh, the opera is performing I, now and what they're able to mount, what does that feel like? I'm blown away. I, you know, we sit down in the orchestra and I turn around and I look up and I, you know, and I see the balconies and everything and I go, yeah, this, this is Denver. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's great. before we look at the stage before we see the artists that you're able to bring right. us. What does it feel like um, comparing where the, um, where the abilities of the opera, the organization were then, to seeing who you can draw and, and the size of the audience that you're, you're bringing opera to? Well, I know what I feel. I see the young people. Uh, and I love to see the young people in the audience. I, I think our education program in Upper Colorado now, right now is very, very good. We're, we're outreaching to areas, all areas of the state, and we're actually putting productions on the high school stages uh, with our young artists. And this, to me, is the lifeblood. Uh, you know, Ellie and I aren't going to always be here. And we have to have other people to come in and buy tickets and be part of this opera. We've seen the opera board get younger, and that, and this is this is good, and it's a good thing to see young people in the in the audience. That goes against some people's perception of an opera organization, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. That it's only people of a certain age, of a certain income level, that that appreciate the work. But that's not what we see when we come here. I think it's so exciting, I agree with Larry, that it's how we present ourselves all over the state, largely through our young artists, but because we have international stars coming mm -hmm. here to perform. Mm -hmm. And we do three productions and we tag them one after the other so people get very used to going to the opera. Mm -hmm. And it's been an exciting run. I know we never believed when we got started, as Larry said, <laughs> Nat passing the hat for people right. to put in $10. Um, here we are, almost 30 years later. There were a lot this year we had several visits to the gallery spaces at the Arvada Center. Some of the segments even gave us a chance to experiment with production on iPhones. Here's a look back at our visit during the 50-year retrospective of artist Robert Mangle. I know this, this exhibit is contained within the walls, within the galleries at the Arvada Center. It's on the grounds and it's at City Hall. So what's the name of the whole thing? Well, uh, down here in the main gallery, we got a uh, time, space, and motion. It's a Robert Mangold retrospective. Mm -hmm. It basically covers his works, works from 1955 to present. So 1955 to 2011 is the most recent piece. That's an amazing span of work. Mm -hmm. And what else is within the walls here? Well, we also have Hamari Akita and uh, Monroe Hodder in the upper gallery. That's in partnership with William Havu Gallery in Denver. And in the theater gallery, we have Carl Reed. It's called Last, Lost and Found. Um, it's a collaboration of found objects he found from Sweden, the North Sea, 
Um, it's a pretty interesting show as well. What, what is it that ties it together in your mind? Well, all, all of the exhibits um, and all three galleries feature uh, the four artists are Colorado abstract masters. Robert Mangold has been living here since 1960, so has been a huge influence in the community and abroad. And then uh, you have Hamari Akita, Monroe Hodder. Uh, Hamari's been here and lives in Denver. Uh, Monroe Hodder works in London and Steamboat Springs. And then Carl Reed is a longtime professor at uh, Colorado College in Colorado Springs. So he's kind of been here since, I would guess, the 70s as well. So pretty, it's a, it kind of covers all of the abstracted masters. Of Finally, we learn more about the work in this retrospective, Time, Space, and Motion, from the artist himself, Robert Mangold. What did it feel like the first time you walked in as they were getting ready to install all of these pieces to see your, your history displayed in one place like this? Well, I kind of helped him collect the things, so I had an idea how many pieces. But what you're asking me is a little different. The time I walked in and it was all installed, it blew me away. I mean, it just, uh, you know, I hadn't seen them all together. I'd collected some at the shop, and we collected some out here, and uh, had some idea that it was going to be around 70 pieces, 75. <laughs> that, that doesn't count the two-dimensional things. That's just the sculptures. You know, the, the nice thing about it, it, well, I'll tell you what, it, when I walked in the door, it reminded me of the new modern Museum of Modern Art in New York City, mm -hmm. except for the size of the rooms, it had that same effect of being able to see clear through the space, not everywhere, but now and then. You could get glimpses clear to the other side of the building. Like some of your work. And there it is. It, it, uh, but uh, yeah, it, I knew what was going to happen, but there's a difference in knowing and seeing. Another big story in 2012 was the launch of the National Tour of the Book of Mormon right here in Denver. Here's a portion of my visit with Commodore natives Matt Stone and Trey Parker. When you began this process, um, your musical experience was your first movie, mm -hmm. Cannibal, right? Yeah. And you kind of only had Fiddler on the Roof as your frame of reference mm, for it. done some reading, I see. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, Trey definitely grew up doing musicals, and he's like the musical guy out of the both of us. Um, my musical experience came from Fiddler on the Roof. My mom... Just played, a recording? Just the, the album, Fiddler on the Roof, she played over and over and over, and I think it was to try to get me to be more Jewish and hopefully to convince me to be bar, bar mitzvah, which didn't work. But, um, she had to do something in Colorado. Just, yeah, what else are you going to do? But all, the other big part of it for me was uh, the Monty Python movies. Always they had one musical. Uh, number. Yeah, number, and, every, and they're amazingly well done. You know, I know they're just single numbers, but um, that was basically, that's my musical you know, background. So you really didn't know what you were getting yourself into. Well, I did, you know, when I met Trey in college, we did Cannibal, and then from then on, now, now I do, because we do so much musical stuff on the show. Um, but but, the growing, theater, up in, but yeah. growing up in Colorado, yeah, I had no experience in theater or anything like that. So if the recording of Fiddle on the Roof was your first introduction to musical theater, what was yours? Um, it was the same. I mean, growing up in Conifer, we didn't have a whole lot of live theater. <laughs> so, um, did you come down to Denver? So, you know, I did. I actually came down here. Um, I, I think the first thing I saw here was Cats, maybe. Um, and then I remember seeing um, Starlight Express here. <laughs> um, but really, I didn't. I, I mean, those weren't my, my big favorite. I, I loved the old, old Rodgers and Hammerstein stuff that I got mm -hmm. to see on just on VHS. Same kind of thing, where I was like, because I really did grow up more with a love of movies, and I wanted to be a filmmaker and make, uh, those, you know, make television and film. But in that, I loved musicals the most. And I loved Singing in the Rain, and I loved all the, you know, and I, and I just loved it as a movie. And it didn't even, you know, it wasn't even so much of like, wow, the stage, the stage. It was just like, wow, movie musicals. Like mm -hmm. I was, I really grew up more infatuated with movie musicals than with the actual stage. So how did you translate that? How did you find translating that to a physical? Um, audience interaction with your work. It was a bitch. It was a bitch because we're so used to two. We're also known in Hollywood as the guys that don't test anything. We don't believe in filling a theater with people and sitting in the back and taking notes. We just we don't focus we, group. We don't focus group. No. We just never believe. We just always like if we think it's funny. Then focus group with there. each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, most Hollywood you know movies they're focus group to death. I mean, and really, I mean to death. Sometimes it really shows. Yeah, and it really shows. Yeah, I mean, they really like. Yeah, you can tell they've been committed. But with theater, you sort of, you can't ignore what the audience thinks. You can be like, I don't care, it's funny. If there's a thousand people there not laughing at a joke, you know, you gotta change it. It doesn't, you can't quite have that same ethic because in theater, the audience is part of the show. It's part of the, 
it's part of the it's experience. It's a character, you know, that, character, working yeah. with the, the audience as a character member and then really writing the songs to, to, to say, okay, stop, hold on, I'm going to tell you something right now mm -hmm. because this is important for you to hear. Right. That, that it really, that's what I loved about theater was like, unlike a movie where you're just kind of this, you're spying in on everyone's lives. And of course you I hated the, the change process. Yeah, of course, <laughs> but, but, I, but I love that feeling of being drawn into it. And so that's the thing we're trying to do here too with these bigger theaters on the, you know, because actually the theaters on the road are way bigger than what we deal with in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and so it still is a matter of trying to really draw everyone in, even people that are, you know, way up there. You, your first song uh, that you did with Bobby was um, Hello, the yeah. mm -hmm. opening number. Yeah. When, what was the, the song that made you realize you had a full on show? Hmm. Um. Something more than a sketch where you, you knew this project was really going to work. I think when we, when we had the idea, and I don't, we hadn't written the song yet, but we had the idea that we should do a song like in The King and I, when, right. when the, the woman uh, tells the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, in her version of it. Mm -hmm. And we kind of had this idea early on of like, you know, it'd be great that they're hearing the Mormon story and then these people well, in a very King and I, we kept talking about King and I, we're like, we should have that moment in Act Two when they regurgitate it and say, here's what we now believe. And it's I think it's we when we- we heard you say. Yeah, yeah. and it's like when, Their when, when we had that as, a, as the hook of Act Two, that's when I think we really felt like we had a show that was gonna be about something and, and actually really have a place to go and everything was about getting to that moment. Yeah. This year we made a rare second visit to a production it was bloody bloody Andrew Jackson at the Aurora Fox. This determined company has finally opened after suffering a dramatic setback on their original opening night. Here's a special report from John Moore. Tonight in preparations for opening of Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, we had an accident. Uh, ben Dickey, producer and star of the show, had an accident. Ben was bringing his playbills from the main lobby across the stage, across the main stage, through the green room back into the studio. At, at the same moment, a uh, technician had gone down into the trap, pulling out letters to go on the marquee tonight, and uh, uh, literally, they're paths crossed for a second and it was at the wrong time as he came up done. that was open that's where he went down yeah. we begin tonight with producer director and star ben dickey it's tempting for someone who doesn't know you and doesn't know um, theater companies in town to have thought casually that perhaps this was a vanity production <laughs> You know, because it's Ben Dickey presents, and you're the star, and you're the director. But if it were a vanity production, you couldn't have overcome that incident, that that tragedy. I mean, that's an overused word, but it really was. It, it's that quintessential Broadway story of opening night, hours before curtain. So, what is it that drew you to this material that made it so important to bring this to us? Well, I, I think there's a lot of things, and, and I think you're right. I mean, when I set out to produce it. Um, I immediately thought of a couple of guys to play the lead role. I immediately started to think of, you know, who might direct it. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's some other friends, and and queried a lot of people along the way. But, but what I knew, what I knew definitely, is that I wanted the role of producer because I thought a show of this magnitude, a show with this much, uh, with this fabulous writing, this amazing score, and certainly the political overtones. Um, were just something that, that I was drawn to as much as I've been drawn to really any piece of dramatic literature. You had to create a company so that you could do it rather than trying to convince a, an established theater to do it. Right. I think, um, I think we knew that, and when I say we, I, I think I knew that it was going to take a certain amount of license to really pull it off mm -hmm. and that and that constraints that were put on me maybe from outside forces weren't gonna really jive. Like what? Um, well, uh, the, show's, the show's very polarizing mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, and, and um, it, it can be seen as offensive, although our audience hasn't necessarily found it that way. They found it, I think, more intriguing, but. I think you can find components or moments in this show offensive and still enjoy it and appreciate it because it's, it's supposed to be poking you in the eye like that. Right, exactly. This look back wouldn't be complete without a moment with this special cast. Collectively pulled them into the room and we all just kind of sat there waiting for news. 
So when you're all together in the green room and you finally fi they finally get him out of that hole, and you know he's off to the to the hospital, what what are you saying to each other? Nothing. So, absolutely there, nothing. We, there was yeah. <laughs> exactly. like, we just watched him, and then it was quiet. It was where... just we were just so struck with sadness and. You know, I, a lot of people, a lot of us did get there early because we had so much energy and we were just ready. Like, because we knew we had worked so hard mm -hmm. in three weeks' time. That's what amazed us, I think, as a cast um, the most. So we were just excited for people to see it finally. And so, you know, when that didn't happen, we just, we didn't know what to do other than be with each other. Because, of course, like you said, your first inclination is to, as a human being, as a family member, almost, to, to be concerned about a member of your family. Mm -hmm. But there's also that you were geared up for a show. It was your opening night, all that energy and emotion. What do you do with that when something like that happens? We drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all felt lost. Like we didn't, our leader, our rock, our you know, the person that held us together was gone to tell us what to do. And we all just sort of sat and looked at each other wondering, <laughs> What's next? Where do, where do we go from here? I didn't even say anything. Yeah, there was, you just, we just, yeah, we were lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were actually, we were released. They said, okay, well, you can go home because we're not going to do a show. And we all just we stayed sat in the green room. <laughs> Our stage manager found some wine and we all just toasted to Ben and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sat there, sat like there. <laughs> for a couple hours. Yeah. yeah. That's our brief look back at 2012. It's been a privilege and a responsibility to cover Colorado's vibrant and diverse creative community. We look forward to bringing you more in 2013. And as a completely independent production, we depend on sponsors and support from viewers like you to do so. Information is available on our website at infocustv.org. That's all for this edition. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. With all that Colorado has to offer, we're here to help you keep it in focus. Thanks for watching. Good night.